for duty! At ease. Thank you. I'll come to you. In 1877, one year after the U.S. Cavalry suffered its worst defeat at the Little Big Horn. But you already know about that. What you want to know is how and why I became a Buffalo Soldier. That's what they called it. Buffalo Soldier. The white troops used to say, Head. Looks like the man wearing buffalo. No. Cheyenne Indians called us that out of respect. See, they revered the buffalo. And you better believe you do not want to back a buffalo in a corner. Because when he comes out, he comes out for real. That's just the way we fought. In 1866, the U.S. Congress enacted a law that allowed the colored man to join the regular. Now, I don't mean to laugh, but we served this country in every one of its wars, even before it was a country. And there's always promising us our freedom if we help, which we never got. Anyway, they formed six units the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry Regiment, which were later consolidated into the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiment. And those people sent us to the Southwest to fight their mortal and good years. Fight them we did. My story, however, starts in 1847. That was the year I was born. Now, my mammy used to say, remember the year you was born so they can put it on your tombstone. She was an optimist. Slaves didn't get no tools. A lot of times we was lucky to get a hoe. You probably drove over many an unmarked slave's grave on your way here today. Anyway, I was born on that Tyrell plantation in Louisiana. It's a big plantation over 100 slaves. Run by old master. That is until the day he died while whipping my dad. The third stroke, that man fell down dead. Overseers were afraid to pick up the whip. Slaves made such a fuss about it. White folks thought we saw all trying to put some juju on it. <laughs> My daddy, he was a Muslim, and that meant that some things he just was not going to do. But he was a blacksmith and a wheelwright, the best one in the next 12 parishes, and that meant he had value. That meant he brought cash money onto that plantation. They didn't want to whip him. No. But they did build a shanty next to the blacksmith barn for him to live in. That way, my mammy and my three brothers, we very seldom saw him, maybe once a week. It was really important for him to separate him from the rest of the slaves. Because he was a leader. Anyway. Things got bad in the plantation now because young master took over. Old master's only his son. He didn't have nearly the heart nor the smarts of his daddy. Matter of fact, he had to have a special way to name his slaves. Now, when I came in here and introduced myself, that was not my first given name. No. My first given name was D. Just D. Remember I said I had three brothers? My oldest brother's name was A. Next brother's name was B. Next brother's name was C. And I was D. I told you that boy didn't have much in the way of smarts. Anyway, things got real nasty on the plantation when young master took a hankering after my mammy. But he was deathly afraid of my daddy. Somebody had to go. So one day, I stepped out to the big road and I saw the wagon leaving. But daddy was in the back. He waved. I waved back. I seen him come back in that wagon many times. 
this time. This time that wagon. This time that wagon came back with five new slaves. My daddy wasn't one of them. And I never saw him again. Anyway, they got bad in the plantation now, but before too long, civil war started. And young Massa had to go off to fight. He didn't want to. But his mammy, Miss Kitty, told him how it was done, now I'm going to tell you. See, if you're a rich white boy with money, slaves, and property, you ain't going to go to war as no private. You're going to name yourself a colonel. You get some boys in the nearest town to do a militia, pay them a little taste of money, that's the way you go off the wall. Now, young Massa had a fine wagon made for him to ride in. Nice uniform, all gray with gold bars and stripes everywhere. Of course, his militia barely had shoes, but that's the way that boy went off the wall. And he never came back. <laughs> now, another thing you need to know. If the men's all gone fighting the Civil War, who's running the plantations down south? Slaves. Slaves run the plantations all over the south. Another thing you need to know. If you're a rich white woman, you know how to read and write. The cipher, that's some men's deal. So if your man is gone, you run that plantation. You need to learn how to cipher real quick so you can handle them books. Now, our plantation is no exception. Miss Kitty did not know how to cipher, and she wasn't about to learn. She had all types of trouble with her accountant. Might even lose the plantation. But fortunately for her, head slave out in the kitchen, Aunt Hattie, had been owned by Miss Kitty's family since Aunt Hattie was about, oh, three years old. So uh, one day, Aunt Hattie come in to talk to Miss Kitty. Now, Miss Kitty! I was noticing you know you you having trouble with them books. Now uh, it, it just so happens I, I I know that there's a boy down the slave quarters that can cipher. Maybe you need to have him come up here and help you. Out. Now Miss Kitty was kind of confused because you got to understand it was against the law for slaves to read and write. It was against the law to teach a slave to read and write. You have your eyes poked out, tongue torn out of your head, or you could be lit. But she didn't have the uh, luxury of time to be confused. She needed help right now. Did she say to Aunt Hattie, Hattie, you tell that boy to get up here and about me. Because I need the head. And so every morning when everybody else was going to the field, I was going to the big house. <laughs> right on in that dining room, sit myself down at that big banquet table, spread them books out, and I was running the plantation. I mean, I learned so much about agriculture, not just planting and picking. Business, running the farm. Before too long, Civil War was over and the South was devastated. The Union Army was everywhere. The one tied down, they took it. The was tied down, they burned it down. Never forget the day I stepped out to the big road and saw a great big cloud of dust. I knew who it was. I ran up to the man, ran upstairs, right in Miss Kitty's bedroom. I slammed over the drapes. I said, Miss Kitty, Miss Kitty, here comes the Union Army. And what they don't take, they going to burn up. You know what that woman did? Died. Died. Union Army came in and did exactly what I thought they'd do. They took clothing, drapers, china, silverware, gold coins, livestock, tools, wag they wagons, hay, and everything else, they burnt to the ground. When them boys sat up the horses, I saddled up my mule and I rode out with them. For too long, we crossed over into Texas. Got a big surprise. Them colored people were still working. Here it was after the middle of June, they still working. The slave owners tricked them. Didn't tell them they was free so they could get the last cotton crop in. 
only in Texas. Anyway, General Granger, he steps up on the soapbox in Galveston. He looks around and goes, I don't know why you people are still working. You are free. Let us go. When the Union Army left, ex-slaves did too, and why not? Ain't been taught no skills, just plant no kitty. See, I was different. See, when Miss Kitty died, I uh, found some gold coins she done wrapped up in some of her pantaloons and stuck in the back of a top of her school. I found that money, I ran out to the kitchen. Said, that Eddie, that Eddie, Eddie, look at these gold coins Miss Kitty was hiding in her pantaloons. Here, you have some snow, boy. I had all that money. I found all the money she was hiding in her shoes. <laughs>